Good afternoon, everybody. It's a big honor for me to present some of the data that we collected at our institute in Leiden, the Leiden University Medical Center, on the use of the nociception monitor during anesthesia. Um, I will present two recent randomized controlled trials. But first of all, I will show you some of my uh, conflicts. As you can see here, take some time, have a look at it. Well, the nociception level index, and you've heard some of it already, some explanation already from Frank, is a novel approach towards personalized analgesia. And we consider it an increasingly important parameter um, that allows us to dose opioids based on the true nociception that occurs during surgery. Um, as you know, and Frank already spoke about it, the nociception monitor um, is derived from four parameters, heart rate, heart rate variability, the pulse pressure, and skin conductance. And during anesthesia and surgery, there are several quite uh, strong nociceptive or painful stimuli, such as laryngoscopy and intubation, skin incision, and all sorts of other surgical stimuli up until closure of the skin at the end of surgery. And the NOL, the nociception level index, gives you an indication of the level of nociception, ranging from zero to 100. Um, we try to keep the null in between 10 and 25. Several of our studies indicate that that's the best um, um, range of null values corresponding with little um, nociception, while values above 25 indicate intense nociception and values below 10 in indicate, in fact, overdosing of the opioid. Well, like, and I will stick very close, I will stay very shortly at this slide. The nociception level is a multi dimensional index. Um, I've already explained what it is and how it is derived. And um, already in 2015, we presented a publication on the null. And in fact, it's a validation study in which we were able to show that the null is superior uh, relative to blood pressure and heart rate with respect to detecting uh, painful uh, stimuli. Um, it was a study in uh, 72 patients. And here you can, uh, can see a result of that study. And as you can see, this is an, um, a photo of the null screen and it starts at time zero. You can see that on the, uh, on the axis here, zero goes all the way to one hour. And as you can see, this is, was the beginning of um, anesthesia. Here was the laryngoscopy and intubation, followed here by um, uh, insertion of a gastric tube, and here skin incision. And you can see that all of these painful stimuli are, are very well tracked by the null index. I will show you this slide also uh, later on to show you um, how to, to, to react to these uh, stimuli. Well, what we showed was that the null index was very well able to detect a moderate um, nociceptive stimuli, painful stimuli like incision or much stronger stimuli like intubation. And as you can see on the right, the ROC curve shows you that the null was superior, the null in purple here, and it was superior to a blood pressure and heart rate in detecting those um, stimuli on this um, diagram that shows you specificity and sensitivity. Now, we continued our research with the first randomized control trial that we performed. We performed it in abdominal surgery patients. And what we did, we compared standard care versus null guided remifentanil administration during um, total intravenous anesthesia with propofol. Um, as you can see here, this is the study design. Um, it was major abdominal surgery, and again, TCI, both for remifentanil and propofol. And what we did, we did two things. When null values were over 25 for over one or two minutes, we increased remifentanil target concentration. And when the null value was below 10, we reduced the remifentanil um, target concentration. However, we had one constraint, and that is that when um, null values 
were below 10, we did decrease the Remy fentanyl up to a level of one nanogram per ml. So we did not go below that one nanogram per ml because we always wanted to have some opioid on board. The primary endpoints of our study were the Remy fentanyl consumption during anesthesia. And we had an additional primary endpoint that was the incidences of inadequate anesthesia events and that we defined as the use or the need for vasoactive medication, the occurrence of severe hypotension with the mean arterial pressure below 55 millimeters of mercury or moderate hypotension, 60 millimeters of mercury or less, bradycardia as defined here, hypertension as defined here, and tachycardia. So these are the events that would trigger um, a change in Remy fentanyl concentration and well, an increase in the target concentration. For instance, from 1.5 nanograms per ml to two nanograms per ml. Well, these are the results. On the left, we give you the mean um, Remy fentanyl consumption per patient. There were 80 patients in this study. And on the left, um, you can see um, the null guided data. On the right, the standard clinical care. And you can see that in null guided patients, Remy fentanyl consumption had decreased by 30%. It was highly significant. And on the right, you can see the development, the evolution of the Remy fentanyl uh, consumption during the case. And I show you here the first two hours of the cases. On average, surgeries lasted two and a half to three hours. But you can see that already early on, there is a difference in Remy fentanyl consumption in patients receiving null guided um, analgesia a thing that increases over time. Well, this is the most important slide of that study. And this shows you the occurrences of um, hypotensive events. On the left side, on the left graph, you see severe hypotension, mean arterial pressure below 55 millimeters of mercury. And these are the number of patients that experience such uh, low um, blood pressures. And you can see that only two patients in the non-guided group and 11 patients in the standard clinical care experienced um, severe hypotension. This was significantly different. And in the different colors, you see the duration of hypotension. So um, there were four patients that experienced severe hypotension from one to five minutes. And there was one patient that experienced hypotension um, for over 20 minutes. And this was a a case of what we would consider nowadays a triple low, low dosages of uh, anesthetics on board, um, low bispectral index, and also uh, hypotension. On the right side, you can see the moderate uh, hypotension results with blood pressures, mean arterial pressures below 60 millimeters of mercury. And as you can see, although not significant, but still there was a big difference between the two groups. Uh, nine patients uh, in the null guided group and 17 patients in the standard clinical care that experienced uh, hypotension. This is an important observation indicative that null guided analgesia during anesthesia reduces hemodynamic instability. Now, is it abnormal to find these kind of data in the standard clinical care group? Because it was, if we go back to the slide, it was quite a high number of patients, 11 patients, um, of 40, so it's about 25% that experienced uh, hypotensive events. Well, if we go to this data set that was published in 2013 from Cleveland Clinic, you can see that hypotensive events are quite common in patients. This is a very large data set of over 20,000 patients, and you can see that severe hypotensive events, mean arterial pressure below 55 millimeters of mercury, occur quite often. Um, in about one third of patients, but again, a similar distribution um, of patients experiencing one to five minutes, six to 10, or at the right side, more than 20 minutes of hypotension. Very similar what we found in our study in the standard clinical care group. And these hypotensive events, they have an impact on the patient. Again, from Cleveland Clinic, Clinic the group from Daniel Sessler, and they related hypotensive events during anesthesia with 30-day mortality. And as you can see on the left side, that these low blood pressures, 55 around here, are associated with 30-day 
mortality of around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 to 1% of patients. So reducing the occurrence of hypotensive events is highly clinically significantly and important. Now, I would like to show you some results of an unpublished uh, data set, the SOLAR trial. We continued our, um, our studies on the null, and now we looked at nociception level monitoring during general anesthesia, now with fentanyl and sevoflurane during abdominal surgery. And our main endpoint here is post-operative pain. And we performed the study at two sites, both in our site at Leiden University Medical Center here on the left, as well as a somewhat smaller hospital close by, the Al Raina Hospital, and we performed it completely independently. We did train the people at the other hospital, but when they were uh, sufficiently trained, we let them perform the study on their own. And again, like our previous study, it was a null guided study versus standard clinical care. We used the data from the previous study to power the study to perform a sample size um, estimation. And we uh, performed the study in 50 patients, 25 null guided, 25 standard care. Again, major abdominal surgery, now SIVO and fentanyl. We kept BIS value, and I haven't spoken about the BIS value before, but we always keep it constant at around 50 plus or minus 5. We find that the best BIS value. And like our other study, um, we used a cutoff null value of 25. So when null values increased over 25 for at least one minute, we gave an additional bolus of fentanyl. Um, and when the values um, were lower than 25, we gave no opioid. And like I said, the post-operative pain score was our primary endpoint. We had a secondary endpoint that was opioid consumption both during the case, so fentanyl consumption as after the case, morphine consumption. And we had one, now we had several tertiary endpoints, but this is the most important one. We also measured stress hormones during anesthesia and in the recovery room. And we measured uh, ACTH and cortisol. Blue, the null guided data, and in red, the standard clinical care. And then on average, it's about 1.6 uh, points difference, highly significant difference. And on the top right, I tell you that also the severe observation of severe pain, meaning uh, pain scores of six or greater, were uh, less in the null guided group compared to the um, standard clinical care. On the right side, I gave you the average pain scores in the recovery room over time between the two groups. Um, and you can see that the, the two groups differ by about 1.6 uh, points, pain points, a uh, highly significant difference, as you can see. Now, what about the secondary endpoint, the uh, fentanyl consumption? Here you can see the cumulative fentanyl consumption over time. Um, in red, the null guided group, in blue, the standard clinical care. And you can see that uh, over time, these are 95% confidence intervals, they overlap. So the two groups were not significantly different. But if you look at the variability between the two groups, in red, I show you the, um, the two arrows indicate the, the much larger, twofold larger variability in the null guided group than in the uh, standard clinical care group. This is important as it indicates that if you personalize the uh, fentanyl dosing based on the null, you will be much more variable than when just using your usual protocols based on hemodynamics. Variability will be greater because people differ tremendously and the nociception will also differ um, among the patients that you treat because of the difference of um, the, the tissue damage that is caused uh, during surgery. Well, I find this slide most important, um, one of the most important results of our uh, second RCT. These are the stress hormones um, prior to surgery, uh, during surgery and following surgery. And as you can see, prior to surgery, stress hormones were relatively low, this value um, is obtained at about 30 to 50 minutes before the end of surgery. And these values were obtained in the recovery room. 
In green, we have the null guided groups. In red, we have the standard clinical care. And you can see this is ACTH, this is cortisol, that stress hormones were about um, a third to a half of the values observed during standard clinical care in the null guided group. This is a highly important observation, and we found it in the two centers independently. So null guided analgesia during anesthesia causes is associated with less stress hormones than standard clinical care. Well, finally, if we look at the morphine use, morphine consumption by our patients, in fact, let's just stick to the top here. This is the standard clinical care. And in blue, the uh, null guided group, there was not much difference between morphine consumptions in the two groups, despite much less pain in the null guided group. Quite an interesting observation. There was a trend towards lesser uh, morphine use in the PACU, in the recovery period, uh, in the null guided group. Um, this is really important. We observe no differences between the two sides. We also observe no differences in results between men and women. And um, I haven't discussed that so far, but in the second trial using fentanyl, there were no differences in hemodynamic events. In fact, hemodynamic events in terms of uh, hypotensive events hardly uh, ever occurred with fentanyl. Well, the conclusions of the two studies is um, that uh, when you use a rapid acting opioid like remifentanil, by guidance of dosing remifentanil, by null, we have less hemodynamic instabilities. In the fentanyl study, we saw less postoperative pain and less stress hormones, and we really believe that it's important because high pain scores are associated with reduced uh, patient comfort, uh, increased morbidity, um, longer recovery time, prolonged use of opioids, and also use of opioids um, beyond the stay in the hospital, possibly even chronic pain and reduced quality of life. I thank you very much.